welcome everybody to lecture three. Today, I hope I have all the most of the bugs sorted out. So the screen uh, saver is off on my iPad whenever this app is open, so it shouldn't lose uh, sharing. Secondly, my Apple Pencil is nicely charged. Thirdly, I don't know if people know this, but you can actually see me also. See, I have this habit of sometimes gesturing to the screen like this. And uh, it's part of a lecture after all, and you can see me whether my window, so there that I'm logged in twice, once uh, as my iPad and once in the window where you can see me. And I don't know how your setup is, but if possible, uh, try to see if you can see me because I might just show things with my hands. Uh, that, that's just a habit. Okay. Uh, but more, most important is obviously the, uh, the, um, the iPad, uh, the note, note paper, which is open now. Good, so let's start. So we've defined uh, about two thirds of the concepts we need in a topological space. And I think people have got used to the idea that the topological space doesn't have most of the attributes of most of the spaces that we know. It's not a group, not a vector space, uh, not a linear space, not a, um, what else? Uh, it's not anything, it's only, a, it's not a manifold. Um, it's, uh, it, it's only a topological space. And one of the really uh, fun things is to try and recast all the things we know uh, for familiar spaces into the language of topology, which is the language of open sets. That's all there is in topology, a set and its open sets. And if we can recast it that way, then we have a much more general version of our original definition. Our original definition would have only applied to, for example, Euclidean space. The general version applies to any topological space, and that's why we are doing topology. Okay. Now, uh, among other things, we have defined by now already are a concepts like um, let's see what uh, we've defined a metric, which is an option. It's not necessary. We've defined basis for a topology. Then we defined closure. We defined limit points, and we defined connected spaces. So you may think that limits and connectedness have to do with Euclidean geometry, but they, but this is more general. And again, all the definitions involve only open sets and nothing else. Of course, closed sets are also part of that discussion because they are defined through open sets. So anything which can be defined using open sets is part of a discussion on uh, topology. By the way, this uh, type of topology is called point set topology. There are more fancy forms of topology also. Okay. So the last thing we discussed was connectedness. And today we're going to talk about compactness. Now I'm sure you know that when we discuss uh, general relativity and general kinds of manifolds, then compactedness, kind of compactness, connectedness, uh, and limits and so on, they do come up a lot. And there are things called separability axioms and so on. All these will come up. So everything that will come up in that context will be defined uh, in the language of topology. But as usual, we can't uh, always do it uh, that way unless we take some motivation. And the motivation inevitably will come from uh, Euclidean space. Okay, so let's consider Rn. Uh, I've not introduced this notation, but it's n copies of the real line, and that's what we mean by the n-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, it's not very difficult to understand what this space is. Now, in this space, um, uh, sets that are both closed and bounded have special properties, okay? And let's look at some of those properties. Um, one of them, so first let me say what is closed and what is bounded. So closed is in the usual topology in Rn, you take uh, a set and then if necessary, add its limit points, unless it already contains all its limit points. And when you do that, the set will be closed, okay? Or take an open set and look at its complement, that will be closed. All these are guaranteed, okay? So closed is easy. Bounded simply means uh, in Rn, very simple thing that it can be enclosed in some, so to say, finite volume, okay? This is very much a Euclidean space concept. 
that the set we are talking about doesn't go off to infinity. It's somewhere in a finite region. And you could say that, for example, uh, the maximum, uh, you know, you have a set of points, you could say the maximum distance of any point from the origin is something. That would be enough to say that it's bounded. Okay. Uh, let's look at examples first uh, and then uh, talk about a theorem relating to their properties. Examples. Uh, so, for example, uh, an interval A, B, so closed interval A and B is closed and bounded. Okay. It's closed. That's why it's called a closed interval. And it's bounded because everything is between A and B. Now, let's look at other uh, possible sets. Let's look at the open interval um, A, B. And in this case, uh, it's bounded still because everything is within some finite range, but it's not closed. Okay. It doesn't contain its limit points A and B. Okay. So this is not closed and bounded. Okay. Let's look at another interesting example. Let's look at uh, the semi-infinite interval zero to infinity, okay, including the point zero. Now this is closed. It does include all its limit points. Uh, the only limit point that really you need to worry about is zero, but zero is in it because it, that's why this box bracket on one side. Uh, by the way, I apologize. Sometimes I was writing the box bracket on the infinity side. I have no idea why I was doing that. Uh, it's never a box bracket on that side because infinity isn't a point, so it can't be included. Uh, but this is closed on one side. So this is um, certainly closed, but it's not bounded. Okay. So the open interval AB is bounded, but not closed. And zero to infinity is closed, but not bounded. So it's not both closed and bounded. So these are some examples. Okay. Okay. Now, what are the special properties? Okay. Again, remember, whenever I'm invoking motivation, I'm in familiar Euclidean space with a familiar metric and all the familiar properties of Euclidean space. But I'll soon generalize to give an abstract definition of similar concepts uh, in the general case, the case of an arbitrary topology. Okay. So first, let me say that we give a name to sets which are closed and bounded. So, But that name is only allowed in Rn. Closed and bounded sets are called compact. Okay, so compactness in Euclidean space means nothing more or less than being both closed and bounded. Okay, so it's not obvious that it can be a topological property. Now, Closedness is a topological property because it's related to open sets, but boundedness is not a topological property because what if I have my topology of a, a lamp and a laptop and writing desk, what do I mean by bounded? It doesn't have any meaning. There's no metric on it and it doesn't have any meaning simply. So I need to do something to find a definition of compact for a more general space. Now that is provided by a very beautiful theorem, uh, which is called the Heine Borel theorem. And this theorem is in Rn. So it's a theorem only for Rn. And it says that um, uh, for a closed bounded subset of Rn, any open cover admits a finite subcover. Okay, so of course I haven't defined cover, uh, so I have to define that and I also have to tell you what's an open cover. So let's digress briefly to define a cover. Now, cover is a concept that's defined for any set. Okay, so a cover of any set X, this much is defined even if there's no topology, it's just a set theoretic idea, is a collection of sets 
f alpha such that x is a proper subset or is not proper just a subset sorry of the union overall alpha of f alpha okay so what am i saying in words it's very obvious uh, to cover a set i need to find a collection of sets capital f alpha such that the union of them completely covers the set x namely any L, anything that's in x is in this union the union can be larger it doesn't matter if it's larger it's still a cover as long as it's not smaller than the set x okay so that's a cover it's a very very simple and general concept an open cover is more interesting open cover this requires a topology uh so yeah requires topology is when f alpha are all open sets of that topology okay so if I, if i have a cover of a set x and the cover is made up entirely of open sets it's called an open cover now the theorem makes sense for a closed bounded subset of rn any open cover admits a finite subcover okay and a famous theorem and one which is named after people uh, usually can't be proved in one line and this needs some proof detailed proof uh, i'm pretty sure it's there in the singer and thorp book for those who like rigorous mathematics uh, i'm going to assume this theorem is true in rn maybe it's not there in singer and thorp but it certainly would be proved in other uh, in other suitable textbooks okay uh what i want to do is not to prove it but to explore the consequences first and what we'll do for that first let's explain what we mean by saying any open cover admits a finite subcover well supposing the open cover is made of a finite number of open sets then there's nothing to prove in the theorem if the open cover is made of an infinite number of open sets so this alpha uh, over which we are taking a union here uh, actually runs over infinitely many values uh then the claim is that out of these f alpha i can pick a finite subset of them for example maybe f1 f2 f7 f8 f100 like that and that's also a cover okay so a sub cover is a subset of these sets which is also a cover in other words i don't have to take a union over all the infinitely many alphas i can restrict my union to a subset of alphas and uh, that will also be a cover okay so i hope it's clear what the theorem is saying any finite cover admits an open sub cover and i'll give you a, i'll turn right away to examples uh, in uh, rn and then we'll see what use we can make of it for general topology okay good so in rn we are continuing in rn uh, we looked at three examples of sets which were uh worth con interesting to consider and we noticed that this one is closed and bounded uh the second one is not closed but it is bounded and the third one is not bounded but it is closed so the heine borel theorem only applies to the first one okay so hb theorem is only applicable to the first one it doesn't apply to the other two so just to gain intuition let's see why it shouldn't apply to the other two and to do that i can give you an open cover which doesn't admit a finite subcover okay if i give you such a thing it doesn't go anywhere towards proving the heine borel theorem but it exemplifies the fact that an open cover having a finite subcover is a non trivial uh, property it's not everything has that property okay so let's try to see so as i said i can i can always give you examples of open covers which have finite subcovers that's never going to prove the theorem the theorem is that every open cover as a finite subcover that requires formalism and i'm not doing that here but let's consider uh, an infinite open cover of this open interval ab so ab is covered 
by Fn, which are uh, the intervals minus one plus one by n and one minus one by n. Okay, now these Fn are all open. They are all open intervals. So they are open sets in the usual topology on R. Okay, I'm doing this in R because the theorem heine borel is for Rn, but R is the easiest example. Okay, so AB is covered by uh, these in the following sense that a b open interval is a subset of the union n goes from uh, let's say 1 to infinity fn what does this actually do well when n is 1 fn is an empty set it's not even useful i might as well start with 2 uh, sorry something went wrong with this yeah good uh, when n is 1 good uh, so I might as well start with two. When n is two, I get minus half to plus half. When n is three, I get minus one third to plus one third. Now, as n increases, you see that my open intervals of this sort are expanding. I should have drawn it actually a little bit better. Let's try doing it again. So when n is two, I have minus half to plus half. Then I have minus um sorry not minus one third minus two third i said something wrong so n is three then it's minus one plus one third so minus two third and here i have two third okay when n is four i have minus three fourth and plus three fourth so you see that my open intervals that i am taking the union of are expanding as n increases now, if I take the union of all these as n goes from one to infinity, then it contains every single point between minus one and plus one. And that's, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. That's exactly the open interval minus one to plus one. Okay. So for the interval, I took a simple interval. If you want to take A and B, it's easy to adjust F. So that it's a family of expanding intervals, which only in the limit as n goes to infinity fill, fills up the whole open interval a, b. Okay. So this is an example of an open cover that does not admit a finite subcover. So it's not obvious that whenever I have an open cover, it admits a finite subcover. Mm -hmm. It's not certainly true for the open interval minus one comma one, but Heine Borel tell you, don't worry. It wasn't supposed to be true for those things. It's supposed to be true only for closed and bounded subsets and minus one to one is not such a subset. So it wasn't supposed to be true. Nothing wrong with that. They say, however, now if you look at the closed interval minus one to one, you can try all you like and find any open cover, however infinite it may be, but we'll find, we'll be able to tell you, guarantee for you that it admits a finite subcover. Okay, so the heine borel theorem, uh, just to recap, says exactly that, for a closed bounded subset of Rn, any open cover admits a finite subcover. So it's a property of closed bounded subsets. Now I told you that subs, such sets in Rn are called compact, and now we have the following question. How do we define something called a compact subset, not in Rn, but in an arbitrary topology, in an arbitrary topological space? And now let's look at the theorem and notice something very interesting. On the left side of the theorem for Rn, it requires both topological property of being closed and also a geometric property of being bounded. But the right side of the theorem does not require any such geometric property. It's entirely phrased in the language of open covers and subcovers, which is purely topological. No geometry here, no boundedness, no numbers, no infinity. Okay. So what we do is we take the second half of this theorem, which was true for Rn, and we make it the definition of compactness in the general case. Okay, so what we'll do now is to define, now back to general case, and general case, so you should always think 
uh, is a set S and a collection U of open sets that we give on it, which define a topology on it. Okay, a subset X of S is called compact if every open cover admits a finite subcover. All right. So we've defined compactness uh, in the general case of an arbitrary uh, topology. And uh, once we assume this definition, there are some interesting theorems and I've, uh, they, are, they are written in, in Singer and Thorpe's book and also proved in that book. I've also reproduced the theorem in my book, book though not the pro uh, proof. And one of them, for example, so this is just to give you an example, I'm not going to discuss it here. Uh, if uh, X is compact, okay, actually, yeah. If X is compact, uh, then every infinite subset of X has a limit point. And now in case you're enjoying this course, which I hope you are, you should be smiling because you see this sentence is full of things that we think uh, might be properties of Euclidean space, but it doesn't use Euclidean space anywhere. Okay, compact is defined through open sets. Limit point is also defined through open sets. <coughs> Moreover, when we transport this definition to the case of Euclidean space, we'll find that the definition goes through in the usual topology and reduces to the familiar one. Good. So this is a good time to pause to look at 15 questions. Let's see what they are. Yeah, Akash, I think you haven't actually understood the, the, the metric topology which had uh, unit distance for every pair of points. I think you'll read it again or otherwise email me separately. Hmm? Okay, good. Uh, Shivam, yeah, for this motivation we needed, uh, when I say RN, I mean everything, everything that goes with RN, yes. Um, is cover equivalent to a basis? No, it's not, uh, not at all. Uh, you see, a basis is something simpler. A basis is something um, which simplifies our uh, uh, task of listing all the uh, all the open sets in a topological space. Uh, but a cover is uh, just something that I thought about. You know, the whole point of this discussion is that if somebody is nasty enough to find an infinite open cover for you, can you make your life easier by finding a finite subcover? Yes or no. Okay, with a basis, it's a totally different discussion. So no, not connected. Dhruv has also answered that. To the hosts of the meet. Uh, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I sir, Pune may have, uh, so the, is the internet, Agam, are you actually here? And is the internet in ICER down? I was, because I checked before starting, I checked that the ICER mail is up. I'm home, of course, not in the campus, but I said mail is running, so I didn't think the internet would be down. Uh, anyway, we'll see if somebody is uh, telling me. No, it's not down, sir. I'm in the campus, uh, so it's going fine. Oh, one and three is down, and two is partially up. Okay, I don't know. That's one of the reports. Housing Wi-Fi is also up. Let's hope for the best. Okay. Okay. Open covers are of the subset, Rajneel, not of RN. No, they could be, RN is also included in possible subsets, but the open covers are of any closed bound. See, op RN is not uh, bounded. RN is closed, sure, but RN is definitely not, the whole of it is not bounded, right? So this theorem is not interesting. It only applies to sets that are closed and bounded. So the open covers are of a closed and bounded subset of RN. Yes. Yeah, okay. For, the, for a cover, does the union have to be countable? No, the theorem is exactly, you know, I've been very careful about the wording, though I'm not giving proofs, 
I've taken the wording from Matt's textbooks and this is the exact wording, okay? Uh, if it needed to be, uh, if it needed to be countable, they would have said so, yes. Yes, proof of high neighbor L for n equals one implies for larger n two, Tanmay, I'm not sure, but um, I'm sure there's a proof just for general n. I don't think it's for value by value of n. So uh, yeah, what do we mean by an infinite subset? Uh, Nikhil, I can give you an example. You know, the set of all integers. Now consider the set of even integers. That's an infinite subset of the set of integers. It's a subset and it's infinite. That's all it is. Hmm? The empty set is covered by every set then, Vedant? Um, I don't know, but uh, I don't know why we would be interested to know about the empty set. Um, yeah, I suppose it's covered by every set. Yes, it is probably covered by every set. Um, yeah. Then how is it obvious that the cover in the minus one to one example doesn't admit finite sub cover, Mohammed? Thank you. That is a good question. Let's go back to it. Okay. So you can list all the open intervals in this cover and they are of exactly this form. It's a list. It's an infinite list of pairs of numbers minus one plus one by n and one minus one by n. Now a finite sub cover means that you should give me a finite set of elements from this list. That means a finite number of values of n such that the union over only those values covers minus one to one. But it's not possible because for any finite n, you can't cover minus one to plus one, right? Because for any finite n, my, uh, my element of the cover is minus one plus one by n up to one minus one by n. So it misses infinitely many points outside that on both sides, which are in minus one to plus one. So it's clearly not a cover, okay? So here's an example where it becomes a cover only because it's infinite. So to say it's the last points in the union, which is from one to infinity, which makes it a cover. And notice that this is not a cover of the closed set minus one to one, because this never includes the points minus one and plus one. What it does is to include every point that is arbitrarily close to minus one or plus one without being actually at that point. Okay. And if you find that wonderful, yes, I mean, that's how mathematics is. It is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, is X an open subset of S compulsorily? Not at all. In fact, it's closed, right? X should be closed. And, uh, well, okay. In the, in the example uh, of Rn, X should be closed and bounded. Uh, in the general case, X is any subset, okay? And typically, there's no reason it should be open at all. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, empty set open. I'm not going to discuss empty set anymore. Does minus one and one belong to the FN in the example you have given, Nilanjan? Yes, a good question. No, it doesn't belong to that. Uh, it doesn't belong to the FN. There's no, there's no FN with an n such that fn is minus one to plus one. That's correct. And yet the infinite cover of uh, the infinite union of all the fn is minus one to plus one without any of those sets being minus one to one. Yeah. Okay. Agam, yes. So, uh, isn't minus one to plus one an open cover of itself? Of course, the, 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 the theorem says that every open cover admits a finite sub cover. So if uh, the open cover is finite, there's nothing to the theorem. The theorem is precisely dealing with infinite open covers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, only admits closed set. Hence I thought X should also be an open set. I didn't understand that question. Um, uh, once I have found a finite subcover, I consider this as my open cover again. What can't I find finite? Once, yeah, Parijat. No, no, but once I found a finite subcover, of course, there may be smaller subcovers. The theorem doesn't address the question that if I found a subcover of 53 elements, will there be a subcover with only five elements? There might be, there might not be. The important thing is that if there's an infinite cover, I can find a finite subcover that it does exist. That's what the theorem is saying, okay? Yeah, exactly. Agam has answered. If you have found a finite subcover, you are done because it's finite. Yeah. Is there a way to intuitively visualize the meaning of compactness from its definition? Siddharth, thank you. Good question. 
but you know the whole problem uh, the whole point of topology is that we are taking things which we can intuitively visualize and we are transporting them to generic topological spaces what we gain is power what we lose is intuition hmm? is not easy to have an intuition about a set of a uh, certain number of points uh, with some arbitrarily specified open sets on it and mathematics references are full of examples which are quite uh, strange and complicated and don't remind you of anything that you know where these theorems these kind of theorems or properties apply so in a weird sufficiently weird topology what i can be sure is that there is a concept of compact space it is those those spaces where every open cover admits a finite sub cover and that's the definition okay but i can't give you intuition in that class of examples in, in a general i can't give you intuition in a general situation yes um yeah ogniva has a question if i have chosen fn to a minus 5 plus 1 by n and 5 minus 1 by n then of course uh it's obvious that every open uh then then sorry then it's obvious that it admits a finite sub cover the point again about the uh, original theorem heine borel is every okay so if you find a friendly open cover it will admit a finite sub cover and there's no problem okay but theorem isn't trying to tell you that it's trying to say how uh how bad could the open cover be could it be such an open cover like the example i've given you where it's infinite and it doesn't have any finite sub cover this is possible because the interval minus 1 to 1 is not closed and bounded heine borel says if it were closed and bounded this wouldn't be possible okay so finding a friendly example doesn't help you learn anything about the theorem yeah cover sub cover definition seems hard to visualize why a sub cover is just a subset of all the sets in the cover i don't see why that's hard okay uh hmm yeah okay what is the finite sub cover in minus 1 to 1 closed set suraj good you have but i can't answer that till you give me first the original open cover the theorem only says every open cover admits a finite sub cover the one the, the open cover i've been talking about isn't an open cover of minus 1 to 1 closed set it's only an open cover of minus 1 to 1 open set it doesn't cover the minus 1 to 1 closed set okay there's so not even a cover so i can't ask about sub cover yeah uh, yes could i define a sub cover a little bit more precisely yes i think i said it many times it's a subset of a cover that's exactly right a cover is a collection of sets a sub cover is a subset of that collection that means it doesn't contain all the sets in the cover but some of them may contain all but if it's a proper sub cover then it contains less of them some of them selected ones yeah yeah good the sub cover needs yes the sub cover needs to be some subset of the open cover not necessarily a proper subset yeah of course among uh theorem nowhere says proper uh, but you see if if the original open cover is finite then for this reason there's nothing to discuss in the theorem so let's not get bogged down by the cases which are trivial the non trivial case one of them important one is what i gave you in fact here's an exercise for you consider zero to infinity this one this is all this is also not compact in rn uh, r because it's not bounded though it's closed so find an open cover of this which doesn't have a finite sub cover okay that will reassure you that both boundedness and closedness are needed it's a very simple exercise it will be given uh, it will be assigned also hmm? okay good so with that thank you those were all good questions let's move on now finally we are where we needed to be we've got a whole bunch of properties and we can now take this uh, property called continuity which was our original motivation and define it for an arbitrary topological space which is quite exciting because really there can be things like continuous functions on the famous set which i keep uh, mentioning and which i hope some day will be named after me namely table lamp uh, writing desk and uh, laptop hmm? uh or a set with a few more elements or a set with any number of elements you can have continuous functions on such things as long as you realize that continuity needs to be defined we have never defined it except 
in real calculus. So now we are going to try and define it in general. As usual, in order to do that, and I think I'm giving you some sort of template now, we need to go back to the motivation from Rn or R. Look at continuous functions and discontinuous functions and then ask ourselves, can we phrase their behavior in the language of open sets? That's the one line question. Okay, if we can in Rn, then we can make a definition which in Rn reduces to the usual one. Good. So for this, we'll first discuss, so consider functions. Uh, so we'll need two topological spaces for, for this. S and U is one and T and V is the other. So S is one set, U is its collection of open sets, T is another set and V is its collection of open sets. No claims made whether they are similar, different, they're just any two topological spaces. Now we want to consider functions F from S to T. So it takes every element of S. So if small s is in capital S and small t is in capital T, then f of s is, sorry, if small s is in s, excuse me, I should say it wrong, uh, there's no t, then f of s is in t. That's exactly what being a function means. Now, uh, good. Uh, now, uh, yeah. Um, Okay, sorry. I think I shouldn't have brought in this because this is the general case. Let's let's look at the motivation for some time and let's go to the general case after our motivation is clear. Okay, so now in this example, let's consider functions. Uh, consider functions example. The simplest example is functions from R to R. Let's do that for a while. Okay, so of course, um, if x is in this r, then f of x is in the image r. Okay, let's look at some examples. Um, first of all, let's look at some examples and let's ask how open sets behave in these examples. Okay, so let me take an example for you, a very familiar function, which is f of x equals x squared. Okay, now the interesting thing about this function is that it's not invertible. Okay, everybody knows that it's not invertible because if I took a number on the y-axis, then it would have two possible values, plus and minus of the same thing on the x-axis. And therefore its inverse uh, would take one thing to two things so it wouldn't properly be a function. Okay, that's one observation. Now let's look at some open sets. So first we note that if I take an open set in the original R and I map it under this function, what do I have to do? Let's start with an interval. So I just draw a dotted line here and here, and then I uh, take this end here and this end here, and I find that the, uh, okay, um, okay, my drawing is getting a bit bad and I'm also confusing myself. Let's do a better drawing, sorry. Let's try to do this a little bit better. So, well, you can take any open interval you like, but let's start with this one. Draw. If now I draw this open interval in the X space, then in the Y space, it maps to uh, this open interval. So excuse my drawing, it's all right. Hmm? What, what I want to emphasize is that this part, which is an open interval not containing its endpoints is certainly mapped to another open interval. Okay, so this function visibly maps open interval to open interval. Now let's look at the inverse of this function because it's going to be useful even though I just finished telling you that it doesn't have an inverse. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't have an inverse point-wise, but it has an inverse set-wise. Namely, I can say, let me take an open interval in the image space, okay, this one, and map it back to the original R. How do I do that? Well, I take this endpoint, 
and I produce it both here as well as here. And then I map it here. And I get this open interval as well as this open interval. And you know that the union of this open interval and this open interval is an open set in R. So in fact, F inverse maps open interval to an not to an open interval, but to an open set. OK, is this point clear? So the forward map takes open intervals to open intervals and more generally open sets to open sets. The reverse map also takes open sets to open sets. OK, so in general, we can say that both F and F inverse take open sets, you can verify for yourself that this is property is more generally true. So an F will take open sets of the first space or this one to open sets of this one and F inverse will take open sets of this to open sets of this. And what we have cleverly done is to allow the concept of inverse except that it acts on sets. So what I do is when F inverse acts on a set of numbers, it, it's defined to be all the numbers to which f had which f had mapped to this set. Do you understand? So even though it can be somebody's calling me. Sorry, I have to take this call. Hello. Yeah. I'm giving a lecture. I'm in the middle of a lecture. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I thought it might be some emergency or something. Sorry. Okay. So for this example, we can say that F and F inverse take open sets to open sets. And in the process, I generalize the concept of inverse, even though the function is not invertible point wise, I generalized it by saying that the inverse of a function is defined by the set to which it maps the points uh, in the other set. Okay. Now let's look at another example. All this is motivation. Now let me look at an example of a function which uh, is discontinuous. So this particular function is f of x is, let's see, what did I choose for the notes? Uh, it is x plus one for x less than zero, and it's x plus two for x greater than or equal to zero. This is x, this is f of x, y equals f of x. And um, I think, I hope, oh, sorry, sorry, I drew it wrong, of course, I knew I would. So not this, but this, okay? So this is the point one and that's the point two. Now notice that I've been very careful. The function is discontinuous, however you do it, but you have to tell me what is f at x equals zero. And uh, it's not the first line because there's a strict inequality. It has to come from the second line. So this thing, which I'm making a fat dot is also a point in the function, okay? And now you see that there's a break. Again, I hope you won't get mad at me. I'm just going to redraw the figure bigger so that we can talk about it more easily. My drawing skills are not the strongest point. So here's one, here's two, two and one, and here is, this part and here's this part and here is the included point. Okay, this is discontinuous, obviously in the sense of real line. Now we are going to see what is its behavior and we'll also need the behavior of the inverse function with regard to the behavior of open sets, choosing open sets and to start with open intervals in R. Okay, so uh, good. Now. Let's start by taking an open interval and asking where it goes. So if I take this open interval, no problem. It goes here, which is also open. Okay. Now what happens if I take this open interval? Okay. This is still, let me read about the previous one. This open interval from here up to here under the function goes to this point here 
and this goes to that point. So it goes still to this, which is also an open interval. Okay, and you see that actually the um, function doesn't show any very special bad property with respect to open intervals. Any open interval you take on the left will map under the function to an open interval on the right. I hope you can see that. And it doesn't uh, actually detect this break in the function, the discontinuity. However, now we'll be more clever and consider the reverse process. So we'll ask whether open intervals in the second space under the inverse function come back to open intervals or not. And here we'll find an interesting thing happening. So here I'm drawing the function again. Okay. And now I'm going to take this open interval in the image space, this one. Okay. Now, how does this map to the original space under F inverse? Well, usual story. Okay. So from this end point, I come here and because this is open, so this endpoint is not included. So this endpoint is also not included. Now see what happened on the other side. This is an open interval, the vertical thing. Okay. But it the function actually ends at this discontinuity and there's nothing below. So the inverse image of the open interval is this thing, including the point zero. This is a key fact. Okay. If you didn't get it right away, no problem. It's there in the book. It's the same drawing, much better. And it's all explained there. Okay. And you have to work it out yourself. So we see that inverse image of a particular open set is not open. Not closed either, this one here but it's certainly not open. This one is not an open set, even though this one was an open set. Hmm? It was an open interval. And this happened because of the discontinuity of the function. That's what you have to convince yourself. Now, of course, it all depends which open set I take in the image space. I might take one whose inverse image is open, but what I see is that there is some open set in the image space, which is not mapping backwards to an open set in the original space. Okay. This is all part of the motivation and it leads to the following definition. If you have questions, I'll try my best to answer them. But the definition is a, a function F on a topological space S U taking it to T V is called continuous, this is the definition, if the inverse image of every, this is very important, open set is open. So here's the topological definition of continuity, every open set. So to test for continuity in principle, you need to look at every open set in T comma V, take the function, map this uh, open set back to S comma U under the inverse of the function, and then check whether the set of all points you get in S as the inverse image is one of the open sets or not. And what we've seen is that in R with the usual topology, in general, it's not. That is, there is always some open set in the second space, which under the inverse function doesn't come back to an open set in the first space, but to something else. And that that's crucially due to the discontinuity. Okay. So that's the definition of continuous function. And the beautiful thing, again, I'm sure now you understand the logic of how it's we are proceeding. You see that this definition has nothing to do with uh, the real line or Euclidean space or any limit or epsilon or delta or anything like that. No calculus. Okay. But you can verify and I don't say it can be done in one line. It takes some time for it to sink in and to digest it. You can verify that this definition is equivalent 
to the epsilon delta definition of continuous function, namely that limit from left side to limit of right side uh, are equal and equal to the value of the function at that point. In fact, um, last time, I'm, uh, so let me, I'll give you one more example in a second, but yeah, that's my point. Okay, good. So this is the definition of continuity. And there are a few nice examples, uh, which are given exercises actually, which are given in uh, the book. I think I won't mention them here because the exercises are going to be given separately. Instead of that, let me just show you one more example of a discontinuous function on R. So again, X and Y. Let's take a function which is reasonably continuous, but for some perverse reason, I just remove one point and put it somewhere else. Okay, let me draw the function a little differently. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what I've done is the limit from left side and right side is equal, but this point is just not there. So there's like a break point and I've just defined it to be a different value. Now you can immediately see what's going to happen with the inverse image of open sets because now I can find an open set in the image, this one, such that when I go here and then try to go down, it captures only this point. No other point of the function is in this, uh, has an image uh, in this open set. So what I get here is the single point A. So the inverse image of an open uh, set is a single point. Okay, and a single point we know in the usual topology is not an open set. In fact, it's a closed set. Okay, so this just these are just two examples. By no means I've proved anything. You may try another graph and you may find that the open set you're choosing in the image space, its inverse Im uh, image is again open. Doesn't prove anything. What you need to do is exhaustively cover all possible open sets in the image space and check that the inverse image is open to verify continuity. Or if it fails, then you can say that the function is discontinuous. So to prove that a function is discontinuous, all you need is to find one open set in the image, which doesn't come back to an open set in the uh, domain. Okay, good. So that's continuity. We have two small uh, definition, not small, two important definition left, but anyway, we can take questions. Okay. Uh, among not all open intervals are mapped to open intervals. Yeah, that was exactly my point. Uh, yeah, please don't bring in homeomorphism, Akash. I'm going to define homeomorphism next. Till now, I haven't defined it. So you can't assume that people know what it is uh, and you, I, I'll ask you to wait. Uh, can I give an example of a function where the discontinuity can be detected? No, no, I, I showed both in both these examples, the discontinuity can be detected. There's, it's, I didn't give any example where it can't be. Oh, maybe you were being hasty over here. Maybe I was giving some example. I think you're referring to this this example, which failed to detect the discontinuity, all right. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I gave this other example. So I think you were all being impatient. Uh, very good. Uh, all right. Inverse image of the basis sets be the basis sets for V, no, no. But no, 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 no. Let's not, see, we are talking of properties of one function, right? We are not trying to relate the topological space S comma U with T comma V in any way. One function can't do that, right? There's, unless the function is very special, which we'll come to in five minutes, uh, why would I use an arbitrary function, which could even be a constant function that maps all um, elements of the original space to one element of the target space? Why would I try to relate Bases or anything like that. We'll come to bases when we talk of homeomorphism, which we have not done yet. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, open set minus one, one. Okay. I don't know when this question was asked. Map to zero, one, union two, three. Yes. Okay. I believe you. I have no problem. 
when we take the points between one and two, it's not in the range of this function, then the, in, ah, Arnab. So uh, if the points are not in the range of the function, then the inverse image is the empty set. So don't forget uh, that there, there's no problem with that. Hmm? So this is the beauty of defining an inverse as taking sets of the uh, range to sets of the domain. So it can take a finite set of the range and pull it back to an empty set in the domain. No problem. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, could I check continuity by completely removing the point? No, I can't because without the point, I don't have a function. The function has to take every x to something, right? Otherwise, if I completely remove the point, then x is a disconnected space. Now things, different things can happen. Hmm. So there you can ask the same question and maybe on that disconnected space, the function is continuous. So be careful. We are talking of functions from R. If it's not from R, but a disconnected space consisting of two pieces of R with a point missing, then it's perfectly possible that the same function is continuous on that space, but it's not continuous on R. Yeah. Okay, answer that. New concept on definition of subspace topology. Uh, sorry, uh, why is it a new concept? Tanmay, I defined relative topology last time. It's the same concept, but I don't think it's needed for what I'm saying. Okay, maybe you're having some side discussion that I'm not following. Maybe it would be better to call it mapping rather than function. Shonak, look, you can write a letter to Singer and Thorpe. Actually, you can't. Singer, poor fellow, passed away recently. But, you know, I'm not bold enough to tell mathematicians what they should call them. In topology, functions are functions. So, you know, we can't call it anything else. In another subject, analysis or something, you might restrict the word function to something. But in topology, these are called functions. Yeah. Okay, uh, these are some internal discussions. All open sets in S are mapped to open sets in T. Will it be the same? No, it won't be the same, Amit. I've shown you an example. Um, in, uh, in this example, if you look at this discontinuous function, actually all open sets in S are mapped to open sets in T. It's open sets in T which don't get mapped to open sets in X. Okay, this is just how life is. It's related to the fact of how a function looks when I graph it. The function has a break in this direction. It doesn't have a break in this direction. Okay? It's not a symmetrical thing at all. Take a look more carefully. Yeah. So, sir, regarding that, yeah. in this example, uh, that that set in that open set in X will not map to that open set in Y, right? Because there is there are no points in that open set in X that map to one comma two. So the range, the 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 image will not contain one comma two. One comma two. In y on the y-axis. I don't understand. Um, you are mapping something on the x-axis to its image, right? You are looking at the image of that under this function. But I'm thinking of this as a map from R to R. So, okay, there's uh, there are things called co-domain and range, and I haven't been very careful about that. For me, the initial space is R, the final space is also R. Of course, since this function is not on to, it leaves a gap. That means some points of the second R are not covered by the function. That's not a problem. No, so my point is that this set that you've mapped on X, its image will not be that set that you've mapped on Y. Uh, uh -huh. There will be there will be a few cuts in between. No, I don't think so. Why do you say that? Because there's no point in X whose image is 1.5, for example, right? Okay. So that can't be in the image. That will have to be cut out. There will be an open interval below and like a semi-open interval on top. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Ah, is the union of two things. Yes, you're right. But... Uh, hmm. So there's something wrong with that statement, but I'm not able to put my finger on it. Um, the, yeah. Um, that it becomes the union of 
to open things and I see, mean, I see your point. It okay. won't be open. One of them will be open. The other will yeah. include two. Doesn't look like you're right. You're right. Okay. Look, uh, I think I I just need to think about this more. There is some subtlety here. Uh, the correct the official definition of continuity is always based on the inverse function because that uh, clearly gives the result uh, in all cases. I might have done something here. I might have got myself uh, confused or got I don't know what I have done. But I yeah. think I'd like to postpone this. But it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. I will if we take the topology on the range, then we will get that to be open. Let, right. me, let me do one thing. Let me take this example and uh, do it next time. I'll start next time with it with a very precise statement of the of the of, of what the example is. Also, what the domain and range are. Okay. Actually, sir, I believe what he said is right. If you take the subspace topology on the range of the function, ah, then it is a union of two open uh, intervals. Ah, maybe that's the point. So maybe that's what that was my mistake. I think. Uh, yeah, I think I failed to say that. Uh, I think the yeah. Then the correct thing is to take the range uh, actually to be. Uh, so can someone remind me what is codomain and what is range? I always forget. Sir, codomain is the target set, and yeah. range is the value of the function that it gets. The so codomain is R, and range is some subset. Range is a subset of R, and I should look at the induced uh, or relative topology in the range, and then it's open. That is correct. I think. Let Let me still do this example next time so that I am a little more precise. Okay. In any case, the important thing for us is that the inverse image. Of an open set is definitely not open in general when there's a break in the function, and it's also similar when there's a point that's displaced in the function. Okay, so these are two examples, uh, but it's a general theorem, I believe, that any function which is continuous uh, on R under the definition uh, of calculus uh, is also continuous under the definition that inverse image of open sets are open. Okay. Uh, what if the discontinuity lies at infinity? You know, I don't think that has any meaning. Uh, any function maps an open set to an open set, even if it is discontinuous. Yes, and I think in the sense of relative topology, as we just uh, saw. Uh, yeah. Example of square function and its inverse uh, it be recasted into open sets. I think I oh in complex plane. Yeah, probably. Other equivalent definition without going to the image set. Okay, I don't know why I need an equivalent definition. Uh, yeah, the function s u to t and v uh, no does not is not restricted. It's a, actually it's a sorry. So maybe I should have said this. The function is from thank you, Saradeep. The function is from s to t. Okay, it's a function from a set to a set. No restrictions whatsoever. Okay, but S comes equipped with a topology U and V comes equipped with a topology, v, uh, sorry, T comes equipped with a topology V. Now I can ask the question that do open sets go to open sets in forward or backward direction? And uh, that's when I uh, can use the definition of continuity and say that if open sets don't map to open sets in the backward direction, then the function is called discontinuous. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you all. That was fun. Now let's move on. So we still have time. Yeah. Wonderful how uh, this new system is working well, at least for me. I don't know about you. Uh, so there are some examples. Uh, uh, but just I'll mention one example. Uh, so the example is uh, on any set s with discrete topology oh sorry any any sets s and t with discrete topology that means every set is an open set every subset is an open set then every function is continuous so we can see sort of in a slightly you know these are the extreme examples i had told you so discrete topology is the one where we don't distinguish we just put everything in the set of open sets it's also everything is in this closed sets 
uh, and I said it's not interesting. And one thing is that these open sets in discrete topology don't help us to uh, find any special functions or discriminate functions on the grounds of continuity. Everything's continuous. If you have the indiscrete topology where only phi and s are the open sets, uh, then you will find that pretty much every function is discontinuous. So you see these extreme cases bound for us and they tell us that a sensible or interesting or useful topology is one in which some functions are continuous, enough that you can talk about them, and also many functions are discontinuous so that having a distinction between the two classes is meaningful. Hmm. Anytime I partition a collection of objects into two parts, if I want the partition to be interesting, there's no point putting all the objects on one side or all on the other side. Hmm. So uh, continuity is such a partition. Some functions are continuous, some are discontinuous. And the interesting topologies, the topologies which have subtlety in them, where uh, you know not all, uh, all subsets are open sets, those are the ones which can demarcate continuous from discontinuous functions. So that was a trivial example. There are better examples involving matrices and all that uh, as exam again examples in r4 so you can uh, you can check those uh, they'll be in the they are already in the book okay now uh, now we come to the concept of homeomorphism now there are many things called morphisms in uh, mathematics and they are all generally different there's uh, there's homomorphism, which is a different thing, and it acts on different spaces. There's isomorphism, and there are all other kinds of morphism. This is homeomorphism, and as far as I know, it always means the same thing, and it's a property of purely of topological spaces. Now, what is it intuitively? Now we know enough about topology that we can say it's the property which allows us to identify two apparently different topological spaces and think of them as the same. So what should happen if there is a homeomorphism is that between one space and another is that the open sets of this are the open sets of that, they map the closed sets of this map to closed sets of that. So a lot of all the properties, you know, compact sets, limit points, any other thing you can think of, from here, map to the corresponding properties there and also backward, both ways. Okay, so how are we going to do this? First, uh, so given two topological spaces, S and U and T and V, uh, the function F from S to T uh, is called a uh, homeomorphism if two conditions are satisfied it is well three conditions it is bijective i defined this in the first lecture it means one to one and on two that means uh Every point in S is taken to precisely one point in T. And by the way, under this condition, as you know, the inverse pointwise is also defined. Okay. So if a function is one to one and on to, then its inverse is also one to one and on to. Um, good. Uh, two, the function F is continuous. And three, F inverse is also continuous. So it's sometimes called bicontinuous, continuous in both directions. Okay. So uh, what happens here, again, you can look at examples, is that first of all, I have a pointwise map which identifies the set S with the set T. That means for every point of S, there's a unique point of T and vice versa. Okay. And secondly, uh, the function is continuous, which means uh, open sets of T map to open sets of S. And F inverse is continuous, means open sets of S map to open sets of T. Okay, so both ways it works. Okay, uh, so then it's called a homeomorphism. Good. Um, and if such an F exists, then the topological spaces. Uh, 
uh, S U and T V are said to be homeomorphic to each other. Okay. Now, uh, example, uh, uh, implication, uh, so consequences, very nice ones. Uh, if F S to T is a homeomorphism, then uh, S is connected uh, if and only if T is connected. Also, S is compact if and only if T is compact. So this can be sort of useful because uh, if I can find a homeomorphism between a topological space that's described in some very abstract way, which I can't get a handle on, and another topological space, which is actually secretly the same, but which is more accessible or understandable, then I can try to prove my all my theorems about connectedness, compactness, and so on in the second space, and they'll apply to the first. Or putting it another way, if I prove any theorem like this relating to connectedness, compactness, and so on for the space SU, S comma U, then I've automatically proved it for all other spaces homeomorphic to S comma U. So it's a kind of equivalence relation, okay? And uh, so these are, by the way, these are theorems. These consequences are theorems and they need proof. So I should emphasize that each of these need proof. And the proof is not difficult. All you have to do is take the definition word by word and apply it, okay? So assume a homeomorphism, assume S is connected, then prove that T is connected. Luckily, since the definition of homeomorphism is symmetric between S and T, namely the function is one to one, on to, and both ways continuous. Uh, so you prove it one way, that's enough. Okay, but uh, so yeah, so it requires proof. Good. Okay, and that brings us to the last question, uh, last topic, and with plenty of time. So let's see if there are a few questions. Have I said something? Uh, function b from u to v no 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 it's a function from s to t it's a function that maps points of s to points of t let me emphasize that the functions that we have discussed here are functions on s not on u okay the function gives for every point of s a unique point in t however in general, if the function is not a bijection, it doesn't give for every unique, every point in T a unique point in S. It's not invertible. Now, given the function on S to T, I can use that function to find out the image of an open set in U uh, in terms of V. The image may or may not be that. That's up, you know, that's up to the specific function. May not may or may not be open there. But I can ask the question that is. Uh, what is the image of an open set in S? Uh, what is that image in T? Okay, that's given to me once I've given you the function on S, because if I know what each point goes to under the function, then I know what every set goes to under the function. I just take the set and each point, I send it to its image, and now I know the image of the set. So the function is not defined on sets, it's defined on points of the original set. Very important point. Yeah, according to the definition of continuity of F, won't the continuity of F inverse be guaranteed? I don't think that's true, Achal Vinod, because the continuity of F says that F inverse takes open sets to open sets, but the continuity of F inverse says that F takes open sets to open sets. So logically, these are independent. Now, uh, yeah, continuity of F, in, yeah. For differential, who brought up differentiability, please? First of all, uh, Nikhil, uh, I, uh, yeah, this is the, unfortunately, you have taken the risk. It was your choice. Uh, for differentiability, we require metric is a wrong statement. And I'll prove it to you as soon as I introduce differentiable manifolds. We don't require a metric. That's one of the most important things. A differentiable manifold does not require a metric. Hmm? And again, I'll ask you to be patient. Uh, 
and well, uh, you know, differentiability is part of this course. So I'll just ask you to be patient. Yeah. How would we know if two topological spaces are not homeomorphic? Until, yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, or, you know, that's how mathematics is. Uh, a theorem which tells you something doesn't always tell you how to prove it. And, you know, that's why mathematics is still, is still a subject. You know, uh, it doesn't even some some theorems are what is called constructive. They tell you to find they tell you how to find a particular thing which exists. Other theorems just tell you that something is the case, and you're only wiser that it is so without knowing uh, how to find out that it is so. So, for example, uh, to prove that two spaces are homeomorphic, I need to either find the homeomorphism that function, or I need to use some indirect method to prove that such a function exists, even if I don't know how to find it. But there's no instruction in these definitions how to find that, okay? So please understand that how to prove something is never implied in, uh, in a theorem which tells you uh, a property, okay? It's a different question and it will depend case by case. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sanjana says differentiability can be defined on manifolds. Thank you, which is something in additional to topological space. Thank you, Sanjana, that is correct. Uh, but which doesn't have to have a metric, let me say. It requires something in addition to topological space, but metric is not part of that. Okay. Uh, uh, just, to, just to be clear, a manifold, uh, a differentiable manifold is something which allows differentiation of functions. A Riemannian manifold is something which allows you also to tell the distance between points on it. Okay. And Riemannian structure is an additional structure over and above differentiable structure. Now, they are all interlinked. And in fact, the problem is that in physics, everything comes to us. Okay. It's like being served a meal where all the dishes are there and we have to work backwards and find out what are the ingredients of these dishes. Okay, it's not obvious. The one way to do it, to work backwards from food, is to isolate things and try to work on them and remove things till we can find the original ingredients. Hmm? So uh, again, patience is the virtue here. Hmm? Yeah, not a single definition has needed us to define a topology. All that has been needed is that we have sets, right? No, 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 no. Every time, every definition involves open sets. Without a topology, there's no concept of open sets. So every definition involves topology, every single, okay? Compactness, connectedness, continuity, all involve open sets, okay? And so the same function from one set S to another set T could be continuous or disconnected depending on the topologies U and V. I think you could even change one of them. Hmm, for given U and V, it will be continuous. If I change V, it will be discontinuous. If I change U, it can be discontinuous. If I change both, it can be discontinuous. Same function. Point-wise, same function. So continuity depends on the topology. Very, very important. Every definition I've given from Monday till today requires open sets, I believe. Yeah. Good. Yes. Homeomorphism is nothing to do with topology U and V. No. I mean, if we are given two sets S and T, we cannot say about the homeomorphism relation because, please look at this. Tell me how we are going to define, check whether F is continuous and F inverse is continuous without a topology. On sets, there's no meaning of continuity. The whole point of topology is to define continuity. Rajat has asked the same. I don't know how everybody has got this. Did I really screw up that badly? I'm getting upset now. Covers do not necessarily contain only elements involved. In how can we prove compact? I don't understand that. S and T are homeomorphic. Does it mean that any function, not at all, Ogniva, nowhere, nowhere did I say? I mean, come on. What, nothing can ever stop me defining a discontinuous function. I mean, imagine if there was a law which stopped me defining discontinuous functions, then I could invoke that law and say that discontinuous functions uh, are not part of, uh, of, of my mathematics. It would be, life would be so cool in a way. Okay, can never ban it, right? I mean, how could it be? 
Ja. Uh, Rajat, function is from somewhere to somewhere. Source and destination are supposedly different topological spaces. Yes, but the important point here is we are using the definition, the, the, the properties of U and V, because we are asking whether something is continuous or whether open sets are going to open sets. But open sets are defined by U and V, not by S and T. If that point hasn't come across, then I don't think you were listening, frankly. Hmm? Please look at the book again and please uh, review the lectures. The entire point of topology is that given sets S and T, I have to also add collections of subsets U and V to define the topology. And those elements, the elements of those collections are called open sets. Nothing else which is not in U and not in V can be called an open set. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Last thing, let's just do it and then close here, uh, is separability. Now, this occurs a lot in differential geometry and uh, separability. Okay. As usual, uh, motivation and uh, motivation first. Okay. So uh, let's take, uh, this time let's take R2. Okay, the plane. And let me take two separated points. Okay, um, let's call them A and B. Two, two separated points on the plane. Now, you know that on the plane, uh, possible basis of open sets are the open disks. Okay, now notice that if A and B are distinct points, no matter how close they are, no matter, as long as A is not equal to B, Okay, whatever distance they are apart, I can always define an open disk D around A and another open disk around B. Let's call it DB, such that these two open disks are non intersecting. I said can always define. Of course, if I take a very huge open disk, I'll fail. But if I'm careful and take sufficiently small open disk, I'll always succeed, okay? R2 has, comes with lots of nice properties. If the points are separated by some distance, I'll take two disks which are of uh, radius less than half of that distance and I'm done, okay? So this is a kind of separability. This property is a kind of separability that whenever I have two distinct elements in this topological space and in this topology, which is the usual topology. Not only are the points distinct, but each of them can be put in an open set such that the entire open set is distinct from the other one. Okay, you can see that it's true in R2. Okay, but who knows in a general topological space if I can give such a uh, definition of separ separability, there will be, there could in general be topological spaces. Well, first let's ask how we'll define this in a topological space. And actually you are more or less able to see it right here because these open disks which arise naturally in R2, uh, I don't have those in a general topological space, but I have open sets, okay? So I can actually give a nice definition uh, in a topological space, and I'll give that definition relying only on open sets. Uh, and with this, I'll define a word which is otherwise, which is German and otherwise somewhat scary looking. A topological space S is called Hausdorff. If, whenever S1 and S2 are distinct elements so i should always write s comma u elements of s then there exist open sets u1 and u2 in the collection u such that first of all u1 intersection u2 uh, so sorry first of all wrong order. First of all, 
S1 is contained in U1 and S2 is contained in U2. Secondly, U1 intersection U2 is empty. So oh, Hausdorff is one of, there are many separability conditions, by the way. For example, uh, only uh, I could have a weaker condition that if two points are distinct, I can enclose one of them in an open set, which doesn't include the other one. Okay. That's a weaker condition. And if you're going to do serious mathematics, you'll find examples of topological spaces, which only satisfy that and are not Hausdorff. Okay, I don't know if we are going to consider non Hausdorff spaces in this course, probably we don't have time, but uh, you will see in the physics literature repeatedly the word, word Hausdorff coming up and it is a word kind of word that makes you panic. Hmm? And now you don't need to panic because it's as simple as it can be. Space is Hausdorff if you're guaranteed that two distinct points each can be enclosed in an open set such that those two open sets have no points in common, totally disjunct. Okay. And as we see, it depends on the topology. Okay. I think this was a very easy definition. Uh, and with this, I'm almost finished with the thing, but let me give you a few more comments to close. We are, I have two, three minutes. Uh, one is there are some more definitions that are related to separability, which I don't use just now, but they'll be useful later. And um, uh, these have to do with the following thing. Uh, okay, let me give the definition rather and then um, uh, then, and then explain why they are interesting. Suppose S U is a topological space and X is any subset of S, any, not necessarily open, closed and no properties, just any subset. Okay, then the interior, the fascinating word of X called X circle, I don't know exactly why, is called, is defined as the union over all UI, which are fully subsets of X. And of course, they are in the topology of this year. So what did I do? I took the set X, then I looked at every open set in my topology, which is fully contained in X. Okay. So UI are of course in U, that's the topology, but I only took those which are fully inside X and I took their union. Okay. And I claim the result is the interior of X. Now, maybe you can see what's happening. So example from R2 is a nice one from R2 with usual topology. So supposing I take a disc, a closed disc. Closed disk means I took the open disk and then I added all the limit points which are on the boundary or equivalently I just said that it's the set of all points in R2 with mod X less than or equal to one. Okay, so this is my X. Now, what is X zero, the boundary, sorry, the interior. So for that, I have to take all open sets in R2. Now it's pretty hard to take all, but I have a basis. The basis are open disks. So I'll take all open disks like this, all possible that I can fit inside X. Okay, but remember these are open disks. Okay, now if I take the union of all these open disks, I don't get X back. I actually get that the union over UI in X of ui is equal to, which is the def by definition is x0, is the set mod x strictly less than one. The boundary points don't, don't get included. Can you see why? Because I'm trying to fill this with open disks. Open disks can never be fully contained in x and also contain a boundary point. Okay. By the way, I'm using the word boundary point because this is in R2 and this is a method to define boundary 
for a general topological space. So this example tells me that the interior of a closed disk is an open disk. Now, interestingly, the interior of an open disk is the same open disk. If, we, if I started with an open disk, I would get the same open disk. So, uh, interior basically in this sense, in R2, in a very intuitive sense, removes the boundary. So, that leaves us with our last definition and, and then I'll end for today. The boundary of X is the difference, by the way, this is a set theoretic difference and I'll explain it, X bar minus X zero, okay? Uh, so we'll call it B of X. X bar is the closure of X. And this one I've just defined as the interior. Now it's known that X zero is a proper subset, right? Because uh, from my definition, it's obvious that X zero, not proper, but X zero is a subset, okay? And uh, because X zero is a subset of X, it's also a subset of X bar. So X bar minus X zero is the set of points which are in X bar and not in X zero. So this minus is the set theoretic difference of a set and its subset, okay? And notice that for both closed and open disk that I defined above, uh, B of X is the unit circle. This is a nice exercise for you to work through. In the case of open disk, the interior is X0, but the closure, uh, interior X0 is the open disk, but the closure is the closed disk. Okay, and therefore the difference is the circle. For the closed disk, the closure is itself, but the interior is a subspace, which is only strictly uh, inside the boundary, and therefore the difference is the boundary. So notice that in this way, I've defined uh, interior, where did it come? Yeah, here. Oh, sorry, after house stuff. Uh, interior. I defined it purely using open sets. And therefore, I've defined boundary of a set uh, in a topological space purely in terms of open sets. So we have a topological definition of both interior and boundary. Okay, and that's all the topology I was planning to do. I've finished it in these three lectures. So thank you. Now we are open for questions. There are many piling up. Uh, uh, interior of a set is an open set. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, uh, Shonav. In fact, I should have said so because the interior is a union of open sets and any union of open sets is open. So yes, the interior X zero is always an open set. So that's, yeah, thank you really. It's, uh, I should have mentioned it. The point is X could have been open or not open, but X zero is always open. Likewise, X could have been open or, again, open or not open, but X bar is always closed because it's the closure, okay? So closure takes the limit points and adds them if needed. Uh, boundary in some sense takes away the limit points. I mean, in some sense, that's that's just words. The definition is very precise. Yeah, good. Thank you, Sean. That was a good uh, comment. Um, yeah, we call a topological space Hausdorff if we can find. No, 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 not if we can find, but every pair of points F1 and A, Akash, every pair of points S1 and S2 uh, should have the separability property. Every pair of points which is distinct should be possible to enclose in open sets, which are also distinct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I noticed that Dhruv is answering before I can. Very good. That's probably, yeah. Okay. In S and also in U, there will be Sandeepan. S1 and S2 is in S and also in U, then there will always be a U1 and U2. I don't know what you mean, Sandeepan, by saying S1 and S2 is in S and also in U. S is a set of points, but U is not a set of points. U is a set of sets. So are you assuming that 
among the sets in U, S1 and S2 are individually sets. That's very special. U1 is S1 and U2 is S2. Yeah, I guess so. I guess you could. It's very, yeah, no, I think it's all right, but it's not a very interesting case. Hmm? Because uh, if individual points are in U, then that makes it more like a discrete topology. And then in discrete topology, everything is possible. Is the boundary union of limit points? No, no, no. Yeah. Union of all limit points gives closure. Yes. Thank you, Sanjana. Interior isn't necessarily the circle without the boundary in your example. It is necessarily. Yes. Why? Why isn't it necessarily? Circle. I don't know what you mean by circle without the boundary. There's disk. Circle is just those points. It is the boundary. Okay. Interior is always uh, the set of points mod x less than 1. That's the interior. Yeah. Homeomorphism preserves Hausdorffness. Absolutely. Thank you, Tanmay. Okay. All topological properties are same in two spaces, which are homeomorphic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, thank you all. I'm done. I've also, I think, gone through all the questions and we'll close now. A little over time, but not too bad. And see you next time.